Well, Tammy, I am so glad to see you, a fellow lover of the word, and um, just you've declared joy throughout the, all the seasons of your life. And I'm just so honored to have you today on Significant Women. But Tammy, we always love to start with your story. And your story is a rich one, and it has the fingerprint of God all over it. So can you just, just tell us who Tammy Trent is, where you've come from, what you've experienced, the beat of your heart? Wow, that's a loaded question, Carol. <laughs> who am I? Who are any of us? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, first and foremost, I, I feel like I, I really, without sounding overly spiritual, I would be no, I would have nothing. I would feel so completely lost if I didn't understand what it meant to have a real, genuine relationship with the one who has loved me the most the one who has provided, the one who has cared for me, the one who has, has had the answers when I haven't. And that has been a choice that I made when I was so young to begin a relationship with Jesus. And I'm so grateful for that because my life has gone through so many ups and downs. My faith has been tested. Um, I've screamed at this God of mine. I've been angry. I've been, you know, tested so many times. And yet I've also found deep faith in the middle of questioning. Uh, I've never let go. Even when life has broken and life has let go, I've never let go. And I'm grateful for that uh, sustaining relationship that I've had with Jesus since I was a little girl. So I was raised in a Christian home and went to an awesome church uh, growing up, and uh, I met this kid in my youth group when I was 15 years old. And at that time, as a 15-year-old girl, I was really involved in my high school. I was a drummer, so I played in the pep bands, and I uh, I loved making people laugh. So I always won that award of class clown, which was such an award for me, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, something I worked hard at. But I I loved that, and and I played basketball. I excelled in sports growing up, and and they were such, uh, not necessarily an identity for me, but something that I, that really filled my time. And it just became natural for me. And basketball was my main sport. So I, I, I was very involved in high school, very involved in my youth group. So I played in the, in the, the worship team and I sang and I, you know, I kind of was involved in a lot of different things. And um, mainly because I'd also come from a broken home. So I think that filled some kind of void in my life, um, the absence of my father and that kind of relationship. So instead of going down this path of, of feeling without and feeling without love and attention, I put my attention into other things growing up, probably without even realizing that I was doing that. And I just dove all into that. And when I was 15, I, I remember setting in my youth group with my girlfriends and I'd gone to a very charismatic church. You know, our church was a kind where we lifted up our hands and we worshiped the Lord and we sang Jehovah Jireh 77 times in a row, <laughs> over and over and over again. And I remember sitting there with my girlfriends, just worshiping God, singing Jehovah Jireh. And in came walking in the back of the room, three of the yummiest guys I'd ever seen. And I was like, well, who are these guys? And I, I watched them walk in they found their seats and they started to lift up their hands and worship God. And I thought as a 15 year old girl, I thought there's something very attractive about that. And they had their football jerseys on. So they were, you know, not nerdy. They were very good looking, very athletic and just, you know, nobody had ever seen them before. And they came in and started worshiping God. And every girl was like, you know, <laughs> who are these guys and where are they from? So I got to meet them. And I found out that we lived on the same side of town together in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And uh, we got to go to the same fellowship group together at that time. And so I got to know them. And I had my eye on the youngest brother of the three. And he had his eye on me. And I couldn't believe it because I was, again, painting that picture. I was such a jock. I was such a tomboy. Every beautiful girl in the youth group of, we had about 400 kids in our youth group. Every girl was drawn to these guys. And this guy wanted a date. And for some reason, he said... I'm going to call you on your 16th birthday when you can date. And I thought, awesome. The phone rang, it was Prince Charming, and we went on our first date at 16. And it was some of the greatest seven and a half years of my life continuing to date this guy. He was fun. He was adventurous. He loved the Lord. He loved me. Um, 
and I, I got to experience um, a different relationship with Jesus through his eyes and through his relationship because he had come to faith later in life. So things were new to him, the way he sought after the things of God, the way he was interested in learning about the things of God, it was very appealing to me. Uh, and in our youth group at that time, we talked about purity and about true love waits. That's when we began to hear this message. And I thought, well, what is this? And and we both made a decision, like this was something we wanted to walk this path of purity. And I struggled with it because I wanted to be loved. I wanted someone to love me. And I think that came from the root of coming from a broken home, mm-hmm. not having a father in my life every day, telling me that I was beautiful, that I was a princess, that God had plans for my life. Mm-hmm until this young man walked into my life. So it was something I really struggled with because I really wanted to be loved. But every time I was weaker, he was always stronger. And he would tell me things like, I believe that God has a plan for our lives. And, and I, I believe it starts now with us making the right decisions. And he'd go beyond that to say, but I want to protect our relationship. And I thought, man, I've never had anybody tell me they want to protect me in this way and protect the relationship. And I just, I fell even more in love with this guy. So I went off to Bible college, came back after a year and thought, I've got to marry this guy because after seven and a half years now, I can't take it anymore. (laughs) I want to spend my life with him. And we walked down the same aisle where we had met seven and a half years prior. And I remember looking at this guy thinking, I get to spend the rest of my life with my best friend, with my soulmate. Um, with this gift from God. He's just everything and he's fun and he's, he's alive and he covers me well. And everything I experienced in our dating relationship truly just now overflowed into our marriage. And I felt like the luckiest girl, really. I was a woman that knew love every single day and it was faithful. It was consistent. Uh, He put me first when many times I didn't deserve it. Honestly, I was the forgive me girl in the relationship. I I was the one that was very passionate, (laughs) you know, said things without thinking. I didn't process this properly. And so it just comes out and can be hurtful or not thoughtful. Um, And I would often say in those moments, like, babe, I'm sorry. Like, why, why don't you just, you know, maybe leave the room or walk out or just it's enough or, you know, put me in my place properly. Whatever the case was in those times, he would just say, Tammy, I want you to be free. I want you to be free to express. I love your passion, but I also, I don't want you to to think I'll ever leave you. You know, I'm just going to get in the car and drive. I don't want to leave you. I don't want to hurt you in that way. I never want you to think I'll ever leave you. I want God's best for you. Wow. I want you to be able to give me this stuff so that I can help you with it. And then you can be free to be who God has called you to be. And that kind of covering, that, that kind of what speaking into my life, it was something that I took for granted because I never thought I would live a day without that kind of covering in my life and that kind of man in my life because he was just bigger than life. So I just thought I would just never live without that or have to live without that. And um, it was in 1995 that I signed my very first record deal. So I took his first name as my last name. Together, we were Tammy and Trent Linderink. But on the platform, I became Tammy Trent. And I loved it because we were really in this thing from the very beginning, since we were 15 in our youth group, going off on mission trips together, doing local things in ministry together. And now here we were in full-time ministry together. I asked him to leave his family business, come on the road with me full-time. And he, and he reluctantly said yes. <laughs> so how long had you been married by this point, 1995? Well, we were married in 1990. So okay. if I were married for five years when I signed this record deal, okay. a dream that I'd chased after since I was a little girl. And yeah. uh, he was so faithful to say, I'm along for the ride. I've mm-hmm. been watching it. I see it like we're in this together. Let's do it. And we, we did, we took off man. wherever God opened up a door. We just, we went through it and it didn't matter if I was on a bus touring or if we were in our suburban packed with all of our merchandise in the back driving 18 hours to get to the next venue through the night while I'm sleeping in the back row. And he's just getting us there. I remember one time on a new year's Eve, we had a Chicago event, new year's Eve at a church. So midnight one o'clock. And I had to be in from Chicago into Minneapolis the next morning at 9am, something like that, doing another event uh, for uh, new year's day. And we loaded up that car and he drove through the night as I slept and we got there and, you know, things like that. He never complained. He was like, let's do it. It's an adventure. And I loved it. We knew that we were right where God 
wanted us to be. Yeah. And I think that was also just loving people, just serving people, serving God, and just doing what we love to do. We were venturing, we were seeing the world, and it was it was fantastic. Yeah. It was fantastic. And it was in September of 2001, after 11 years of marriage now, seven and a half dating prior to that. So together a long time. I remember in this month, the beginning of this month, asking Trent about um, starting a family. And I remember saying, babe, like, where are you at with that? You know, I, I think I'm finally ready to start talking about that because we just love life for 11 years of marriage. We just, we love just taking off whenever we wanted to. And, you know, the responsibility of something more was like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready for that, but I think we finally were in that place. And he said, gosh, I've been ready for a long time. Uh -huh. I've just been waiting for you and want to make uh -huh. sure that you're ready, no regrets. And so we had this feeling that something was shifting and changing in our marriage, but we just didn't know exactly what it was. So we started there. We added maternity to our insurance, got a phone call to go on a missions trip to Jamaica. And we thought, this is another adventure. Let's, let's go. Let's go a week before we'll vacation on one side of the island before we start the mission trip. We packed our bags. We headed to Jamaica. We had such a great time that week. Uh, I remember our cell phones didn't work, uh, no computers. It was just us time. And it was really a pivotal time to say, like, what's next? Like, God, what do you have next? There, there's so many noises and voices in all of our lives. And sometimes we have to make very intentional decisions and choices to step away from all of it and just get with the one who has the clearest voice of all. And I think when we step aside all of that, our wants, our desires, um, our agendas, and we set that all down, we're on level playing ground and we say, God, speak, speak and give me the words, give me the words, give me the ears, mm. have a conversation with you and to listen to you. Mm. And I think genuinely that was the place that Trent and I were in. We knew that this time was going to be pivotal. So we took advantage of that and we listened and we said, this is it. This is what we feel um, that God is up to something and, and let's just dive all in whatever that might look like. So we had one day off in between finishing up our vacation to begin this mission trip. And then Trent said, what do you want to do on this day off? And I said, well, if I know you, like I know you've made a list of things, you researched a million things in Jamaica. And at the top of his list was a place called the Blue Lagoon, a legendary place called mm -hmm. the Blue Lagoon in Jamaica. He found out that in the middle of the lagoon was a hole that went down about 240 feet deep and he wanted to explore. He'd been a certified diver since the age of 12 and uh, he dove all over Michigan, every lake possible. He was a smart diver. He never did anything to take a risk. I was never afraid of Trent being in the water. So we headed there that afternoon. We had lunch on the edge of the water and then Trent suited up. He had his underwater scooter with him that he took everywhere. He was in his full body suit and his mask and his fins and his snorkel. And um, that particular day, Trent was free diving. And that's when you go in the water without oxygen, without tanks, you hold your breath. And uh, he could hold his breath up to about four minutes underwater. Wow. He's so good at it. He practiced yeah. every night in the bathtub. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> It was fantastic. And I had to time him. So there we were finishing lunch on the edge of the water. Trent said, babe, I'm going to be gone for just 15 minutes. And when I get back, we'll go do something that you want to do. And I said, that sounds great. I finished lunch. Trent was on the edge of the water. He slipped into the water. And halfway between that dock and that hole in the middle of the lagoon, he lifted up his head out of the water, just like he had done so many times before. Like that was sort of our thing too. To take every opportunity to wave goodbye one more time. And uh, he did it again. He just kind of did this cute little wave. And that was what we always did. And I would wave back. And as I waved back, he sunk beneath the surface. And he was gone. Hmm. I had no idea at that moment that that would be the last time I would ever see Trent again. 
I got sidetracked and watched some other swimmers and snorkelers in the area and finished my lunch. And, uh, 30 minutes had turned into 45 and into an hour. And I thought this, this isn't right. Like Trent was the kind of guy if if he said he'd be gone for 15 minutes, he meant that, or he'd come back and tell me so that I was never afraid. But this day now we're creeping into an hour and I knew something wasn't right. Mm -hmm. So I got up and I got close to the edge of the water. And I remember looking out into this lagoon and thinking I'd have to see him every few moments come up for breath. And, and I saw nothing. Just about that time, a boat came into the lagoon, circled over the hole where he was diving. And then it docked and I asked the guys to take me out and search for Trent and we began to circle this lagoon and oh my gosh with each passing moment I couldn't help the feeling of knowing that my life would never be the same again like it just it was so um I felt very numb mm -hmm. I was definitely in shock but I had the realization like this isn't going to turn out the way you hope and I had enough strength within me to just sort of not lose it in front of all these people, but just sort of somehow God gave me enough grace to just hold it all together. And I think that in our human nature, there's enough of us that, or hopefully all of us that hold out hope until like all hope feels gone in those moments. And so that's where I was, even in, in the place of knowing that my life would never be the same again. I still think I was just, I just was clinging on to that, that, that lifeline of hope. And um, I called in a dive team that began to search for, for Trent. And um, during that time, I went to this back room of this restaurant there at the edge of the water. And I just, I just wept and I cried and, and I called everybody I could think of. And crazy enough, everybody was gone. My family, it was voicemail after voicemail. I couldn't reach anybody till I reached Trent's mother and said, please send somebody. My father-in-law was in LA at the time. And she said, I'll get a hold of him, see if he can catch a flight to you. And she was the only one that I reached and um, hung up the phone. And I just, just began to lift up my hands toward heaven. It was like an automatic reflex. Mm -hmm. Like I practiced for that moment my whole life. Those of mm -hmm. us that have been especially raised in church, you raised in faith or even come to faith later in life. And you, you, you go to church and you, you hear the word of God, you take your notes and you, you, you stand on those promises of God and you, you sing your worship songs and you worship and try to memorize scriptures, especially the ones that are the most important to you. And like I practiced for that moment my whole life and all that stuff came back in that moment. So as my hands are lifted high. I just started to sing songs that had taken me back years. And one of the first songs that came out of my mouth was, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. It was one after the other that just Jesus, Jesus, there's just something about that name and oh, the blood of Jesus. It was like all of these songs at that moment were a lifeline tying me to hope. And I just dove all in. I wanted everything. I needed hope. I needed Jesus. I needed a promise. I needed truth. I needed Psalms 34, 18, that he's near to the brokenhearted and he saves those whose spirits are crushed because I feel crushed right now, God, I need you close. And so I just clung to everything. A dive team came, they started to search for Trent, three hours went by and they came in and said, we can't find him. We'll start again in the morning. I went up to home of two doctors and the next morning the doctor said, come quickly, we wanna show you television. And I'll never forget walking into that room, staring at the television the morning of September 11th, 2001 as the second plane plowed into the Twin Towers in New York City, I thought, that moment, I thought that this must be the end of the world. You know, those, I don't know if, I don't have those feelings ever. I mean, I think that's the first time I ever thought in my life that this could be it, like this could be the end. And I felt that way because I also thought, okay, my America's falling apart, but how could God see this being good for me living without the greatest gift 
one of them truly that he's ever given me. How could God be in something like that for me? So I thought, so, so maybe this is just like, get ready. And that began the journey for me of really trying to find God in the worst moment of my life and the hand of God, knowing the character of God. Why are things allowed to happen in our lives? Uh, especially when it brings us so much pain and question and doubt. And, you know, that, that began the healing for me in the questioning of putting my life back together again. Everything shifted, everything changed at that moment. My life would never be the same at that moment. They recovered Trent's body in the Blue Lagoon. Probably a few hours later, all flights were grounded. So not anybody could get to me except for my father-in-law who did make a flight over to me there. So 10 days we were stuck, all flights grounded, all the questions I have for God, all the wondering and why and how do I now put my life back together again? What do I do with all these broken pieces that are scattered everywhere? You know, that feeling that so many of us have. Here's all the pieces of my life my dreams, my prayers, my hopes, my marriage, my finances, my health. Here it is, and it's scattered everywhere. And who is going to go pick up every one of those pieces? Who is fully aware and knowledgeable about every one of those pieces? And who has a solution to fixing all of these things. Who's going to pick all this stuff up, collect it and put it into a bottle and say, I see every tear. I see it all. I'm fully aware. And I, I believe that I can do something with this. So it took me back to Jesus. Even in the worst time of my life, believing that he, he ultimately is the one that's fully aware of every piece He's ultimately the only one that has the strength and ability to pick up every one of those pieces, put it in a, in a bottle, and that I could believe would somehow put my life back together again. That began an enormous journey in my life when my faith was deeply shaken. Oh, Tammy. <laughs> so oh, I have a thousand questions for you. I try to think, you know, like the listeners think as you tell your story. But before I go there, I just want to tell you this, Tammy. You know, my story is that um, I lost five babies far enough along in my pregnancy that I held them in my hand. Mm -hmm. And baby number four, we were at Duke University Medical Center, one of the finest medical facilities in America. The room was filled with the most brilliant um, prenatal specialists in the, in the Western world, um, probably 20 doctors and nurses as they took the little boy away. And my husband started singing, I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice <laughs> to worship you. Oh, my soul rejoice. You know, you know, if you can sing with tears rolling down your cheeks, yes. it's a miracle. And the miracle begins when in the moment of your deepest pain, you don't let anything stop your song. Mm. And I love that about your life. I love that, Tammy, that even though you've experienced a grief and a pain so deep, that you've continued to serve the Lord. You've continued to bring a song mm -hmm. to the generation of people who are under your watch. I love that about you, Tammy. But the first question I want to pose to you is, I, did you ever ask the question why? And if you did, what would you say to women who are saying, why mm -hmm. today? What, what would you say to them? Oh, that's... You know, I, I have said a lot of things to God. <laughs> I've been faithful. I've been unfaithful. I've been honoring. I've been dishonoring you know, with some of our conversations. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's so interesting. I don't, 
I don't know that I've ever um, yelled or cried out like, why, why? It's so interesting for whatever reason, if it's my personality, um, there were, there were other questions in, that I've asked that probably pertain to the why of like, I don't understand. And how could this be good for my life? And how do I, how do I live now? How do I pick up the pieces? I, you know, I think I've been more, uh, coming home at that time and beginning to put my life back together again. I was so in deep, uh, shock and numbness for such a long time that I almost couldn't get out the why because I think when we asked the why too we're like I'm trying to figure it out and I was so deeply wounded that I just almost didn't have the strength to try to figure out why God would allow this to happen so I just kind of felt like I existed in the beginning barely and I dealt more with my anger of now this is my life and now I've got to figure everything out on my own um, you know, from the simplest thing in my home that would break and I would get a wrench and I would try to fix something and I didn't have the strength to turn it and I would just weep. I would just cry. And it was more like in those moments, like, I hate this. I hate it. So I didn't find myself saying, why, why? I was more like, I hate this, God. I'm, I'm mad about this and I hate this. And I, I think I, I, I almost knew that in my searching, the answers would come later, but I almost, it's like, they'll come later right now. I'm, I'm in this moment and I don't know that I'm going to know why right now. So I'm not going to waste my time asking that right now. I'm going to try to figure out how to get through this day today. So that was more of my quest of later as I began to hear was understanding why these things were allowed to happen in my life. And I eventually got to a place as I began to tour with the women of faith, mm -hmm. taking those platforms on the weekend and being allowed to, um, to feel, uh, giving myself permission to be vulnerable, mm -hmm. to be honest. And I think during that season of, of ministering and pouring out, God began to pour into me. And so some of those questions were just being answered for me of like, okay, I believe that God has allowed things to happen in my life. If he sees that it will serve a greater purpose, much yeah. greater than myself. I could right. never, ever have reached this many people through my albums that I'd recorded at that time. I think I had three albums out doing well. I mean, there was some number one hits and stuff, but I wasn't like selling millions of records. So I was on the radio and doing some things, but the impact wasn't enormous. So all of a sudden now I'm standing in front of 20,000 women sharing a story of love, love and of loss and of hope, taking them through that entire story I've just taken you through, but standing on the edge of the water and showing them as I'm singing and sharing a message, as I'm moving a little bit, and they're seeing this woman come back to life before their very eyes. That was the greatest gift I could give anybody on my journey of faith with just showing them that God was trustworthy, believable, and a, and a keeper of his word, that I was coming back to life again, and I can't fake any of it because I don't have to be here, but I'm choosing to be here to let you just see not just through my words, but to see my very life being put back together again. I could see purpose in that. Mm -hmm. I was learning to give my pain purpose. And I could see why even in that pain, and I've, I've hated that, but I could see, I could see why God allowed that to happen because it was serving a greater purpose, which was yes. bringing people out of darkness into light, was bringing them to a place of joy, helping them to get out of places where they were stuck, helping them to see that even life beyond hard circumstances, living again is possible. Um, and that's been my greatest platform of hope is just letting people know that even though we feel numb, we can interpret that as God's absence in our lives. And so I've not done it all right, but, you know, I've chosen to be a vessel um, in an honest way on platforms all across the world. And I have now seen 20 years later, 
the answers to to the whys that came later down the road. God has given me great answers. And you know, I take Trent back in a heartbeat right now, sitting Carol with you right yeah. here, having this conversation. It doesn't mean I'm going, it's been fantastic. <laughs> I've hated so much of it. It has hurt. It, I've, I've had to go through so much and surrender and sacrifice and, you know, laying it down and the hurt and the lonely nights. I was just sitting up in my bedroom last night, watching the news or watching TV, whatever it was. And I just, I, I turned off everything at midnight and rolled over and the lights were off. The TV was off. And I just thought for a second, like, 20 years later. Yes, God has healed my life. I'm so grateful for that healing. But nobody knows your journey. Nobody knows it except for me. Yes. And what I am walking through right now. Yeah. The tears on your pillow, we don't see. But they're there. You know, Tammy, I think about your story a lot. And of course, knowing that we were going to talk, I've been thinking about it the last few days. And I was thinking, Tammy, so not only did your, your, was your past removed, this incredible marriage you had, this incredible friendship um, that was God-given, God-breathed, God-ordained, but a lot of your future mm. also was taken from you as well, like babies and having a family together and growing old together. Yep. So, so I guess what I'm saying is, so there are the memories that you still have, but you don't have Trent with you in the flesh and blood, but there's also the hopes for the future mm -hmm. that were erased in that moment. And to me, that's one of the most painful parts of your story as I watch your life as I observe you, Tammy, that you had to have the resolve to live again, to build a new happy ever after, if that's possible, because it didn't look like what you thought it was going to look like, right? That is exactly right. And yeah, here I am 20 years later, um, the last 20 years choosing to live again and rebuilding a future has been alone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some of it's been by choice, especially early on. I knew that, man, I really, I really needed to heal from this before I even opened up myself to love again, because I'm just broken. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to bring a broken girl into another relationship, then, then it's already broken. So I knew enough to go like, look, I need, I need to find wholeness in this and in real healing and, and really mean it when I say that. And it, it took some time. And then at that point of rebuilding my life, I was kind of like, I kind of like my girlfriend time, you know? <laughs> kind of like going to Kabul with my sister, my best friend and not having to ask if I can do it. So, so here I was like this new normal going, um, you know what? I, I have learned to love myself. I have learned to be okay with being alone. I've learned to go to a movie by myself to have dinner by and, Look, that took a long time. I remember pulling up to a movie theater in my car and going, there's the door, <laughs> you can do this. And I was like, I can't do this. And look, a movie, you don't even talk to anybody. So I'm like, this is the easiest thing, but I could not do it for a long time. It just reminded me that you are all alone yeah. by yourself, you're widowed. And I was like, forget it, I'm going, I'm going home. And it took me some time, but now I can do all that stuff and I'm braver, I'm more courageous. and. I'm not labeled in that way. Like I'm, I'm strong and I, I, my value is great. I know my worth. I know what I've been through. I paid the price. And so what I have to offer somebody, it came at a high price. So it's like, so now that 20 years later, I become so much stronger. It's like, look, I don't need to go to coffee with a guy to feel beautiful. I don't need to have dinner with some guy just so that I feel loved unless you meet my vision board standards uh, of what I want in a relationship or a man, um, then I'm not interested. Like I'm not desperate. So I'm fulfilled. God provides, I have all that I need. So unless it's this and something that betters my life, because here I was with Trent. So unless you're here or here, then look, I got to experience this. I got to know love the way God intended it. I was loved well. So for me to take steps backwards in a relationship would be really not smart. And so I have just, yes, I'm open, 
you know, people have asked me that, when are you going to love again? It's like, that's not, that's the, the silliest question of all, because I'm open to that, but I won't settle. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm one of those girls that I'll, I'll know a guy, if he walks into my life and says, you want to go to coffee, I'll be like, wow. <laughs> you know, yeah. I have, to have, I have to have the wow factor first. Like, you know, I know we all grew up in youth group and said, it's about the heart, but look, if you have no hair on your head and it's all on your back, this isn't going to happen. <laughs> coffee. <laughs> you need to have a little bit or at least look great in a hat. <laughs> I have a very specific vision board and I just think I've been through too much and mm-hmm. I'm not, um, I'm not going to settle. And I think so many of us need to be in those places of our lives of just finding ourselves and who God says we are and then being stable with that. Yeah being steady with that, know the word of God, know the character of God. We're living in a time when so many people are so quick to jump on the next bandwagon and let's deconstruct the gospel because this doesn't feel like it fits me anymore. Are you kidding me? Right. The word of God never changes. It's the word of God. You are the one that needs to change. You are the one that needs to start transforming your life to fit these very specific instructions that God has given us in a way of living our lives upright, to him and with that that obedience in our lives, which is what I have learned the last five years from being disobedient in some areas of my life, wanting to do things my way. When I started learning about obedience more, what that looked like, God's blessings are so closely tied to that. So once mm-hmm. I stepped into those things and doing things God's way, I started to reap the blessing and the benefit of that, which I'm like, no turning back. There's yeah. plenty of things I have to work on in my life, but there are certain areas now that I'm like, I won't compromise in that area anymore. Yeah. So good. Such mm-hmm. a great um, statement for women who are listening today. So Tammy, what women have been role models to you? Who are the, some of the significant women in your life that you have modeled your life after? They've mm-hmm. spoken to you. They've led you. They've discipled you. Who, who are some of those women? A hundred percent my mother, a hundred percent. I am so grateful for a godly mom. uh, That is always, she's always been that since the day I was born, very godly woman. And um, she's a very protector of, of her heart, garter of her heart, um, of the things of God, very protector of what she sees, what she uh, how she speaks, always been like that since I was a kid. You know, um, I can never remember seeing my mom angry. Mm. Um, and I'm sure wow. she was, but yeah. I never saw outbursts. I never heard inappropriate things. And I'm sure they were there coming from that broken home. Her and my dad, I'm sure had things they had to work through, but I never saw it. I always saw the standard that wasn't like perfect because my mom was definitely not perfect, but as far as her relationship with God and how real and genuine and authentic it was, um, I saw that consistency in her life. And she went on to uh, become the women's pastor, uh, women's leader of the women's ministry at our church uh, growing up at First Assembly of God in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We had a really big church, about 15, 2,000 people. So she was the, uh, the women's ministry director there. And so I got to sit under her ministry there as a teenager growing up and just the women loved her. She was amazing. She loved the word. She loved people. She was a lot of fun and she was not legalistic. She was not religious, but she, she knew God and people were drawn to that. And I was drawn to that. And she would travel around Michigan and into prisons and into Canada and minister. And I'd travel with her. And my mom was the kind of girl that you're like, she heard from God. She knows the crap in your life. You know, she's, like, <laughs> she's on to you, Tammy. <laughs> you know, I, was, I remember sitting like when she'd minister at these churches and I'd be just sitting in a pew, just taking it all in. And then she was a kind of woman, she let the spirit lead. And so if she would begin to, if she was teaching and if she began to walk through the aisles and, you know, God gave her a word to speak over someone's life or she'd walk over to me and she maybe just put her hand on my, my, <laughs> my shoulder and be like, <gasps> <laughs> just, I wouldn't say a word, I would just start to cry because I'm like, she knows everything. <laughs> but it was also just, um, man, she just had such a love for me as well and wanted good things for my life. Oh, she's just so proud when, when I leaned in the direction of the things of God. And 
and I love that it, it put a bit of a responsibility on me, that feeling of, you know, uh, living a godly life. And if I ever messed up or made a mistake, I just felt like I really let her down and even more than God, which was interesting at that time as a teenager. So I had to put that all in perspective. And because again, I didn't have a father in my life. So my trust in my relationship with Jesus was, was a little different because I didn't have that with my dad. So I had it with my mom. And so through the years I've had to learn about God, the father. Mm -hmm. and how he wanted to father me. So my mom was truly the biggest influence and still is today. They pastor, her, uh, her and her husband, uh, Keith, um, pastor a church in Michigan and they're amazing. She's an incredible counselor. She's an amazing woman of the word. When I go home for the holidays, I wake up in the morning to go get a cup of tea and she's already in there watching TBN. I'm like, mother, can we please watch something else this morning? <laughs> but she's just, she loves all the pastors and the teaching it. She just lives it. She's a mentor and an example to me because she lives what she believes. And I'm not a girl that wants to watch TBN 24 seven. Like, I'm like, I want to go like golfing. I want to go have fun. I want to take a hike. I want to take a trip. Uh, but to watch her dive into the things of God every single day, um, is, is a great example for me. I love that. I so love Tammy, it. as we begin to, to tie things together here, one more question, what do you want your legacy to be? How do you want to be remembered when people think about Tammy Trent? What do you want them to remember about your one extraordinary, glorious life? Mm. Goodness, when, when you ask that, one of the, the first things that comes, it pops into my mind is to want to laugh or to giggle and say, like, she was a fantastic dancer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are. I've seen <laughs> this. Yeah. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Um, now, for a little assembly of God, girl, you sure learned how to dance, didn't you? No, I wasn't allowed. My, like my mom said, I know. You, can, said <laughs> you can be free. You shout, you raise your hands, you dance, girl, you be free in church, but don't ever go to a club. I'm going to come and get you. You're never going to want to dance again. But yeah, you know, as a teenager, that was so much a part of my life. I never went to clubs, never was allowed to go to high school dances, but it was something that was birthed in my spirit since I had been a little girl. And it wasn't the dance, it was movement. Mm -hmm. Mom said I started mm -hmm. walking at nine months old. So I've been a mover mover since I was a little girl. And that was a very gift. God knew specifically that I needed standing on the edge of the water mm. so many years later that I could either choose to be stuck and put my feet grounded in that, that muck and the mire and just stay there cemented the rest of my life. Cause I'm angry. I'm mad. I don't understand how could God allow this, that I could have chosen that, or I could have chosen to somehow get up and keep moving. Yeah. And so the movement has been the thing for me and the movement has brought freedom in my life. It's just like, you know, it's just, oh. And so I have fought to live again. I have fought to breathe again. Yes. I have fought for my spiritual life. And with the fighting, I don't just say I'm fighting. <laughs> I'm fighting. Some of us need to speak with authority over these things in our lives and take it back and equip yourself and put it all on and just, mm. so when I sing, when I, on a platform, it's just, you know, it's the teaching is there, the word, the story, but also the, the fight to especially tell women to keep fighting for these things that matter to you in your life. And so dancing became such a part of that on a platform. And I never, I never apologize for it because unless you've walked in my shoes, how do you get to tell me that I can't move and that I can't dance? And by dancing, I'm not talking what we might think of a club. I'm talking about the freedom. Yeah. And if that means you start moving like this, it's just whatever that is for you to find freedom, find it and don't let anybody take that from you. So when I think of that question you asked, in the dancing comes joy for me. Mm -hmm. It's joy. So even in the darkness, um, I pray that people might say, man, she was a daughter of light. Mm -hmm. She was a girl that found her steps again. Uh, she found joy and she was faithful with her story. We all have a story. We do. It's not the knockdowns in life. It's when we choose to stay down. Yeah. Tammy got up and she did something. She learned to give her pain purpose. She did something with it. And hopefully 
I was able to help lead so many to the truth of a relationship with Jesus and what that ultimately can bring. I hope that that's the case. I hope when I get to heaven that there's thousands of people going, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm here because God used you and you were obedient. And I remembered this and I'll be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. And I'll probably look at a few and go, I can't believe you made it. You know? <laughs> You're here too. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh Tammy, it has been such a delight to talk to you, to laugh with you. Um, to hear your story told just from your heart from 20 years later. Oh my goodness. And to see the strength and the freedom Amen. that is in you as a woman of God. So before we go, would you pray for our listeners today? I will. Father, I love you. I'm yes. so grateful for your commitment. Yes, Lord, we yes. uh, especially in seasons, Father, where we just find the questions and they're just overwhelming and Maybe the answers aren't there. Faith is shaken and we just were overwhelmed. The circumstances are heavy. Um, life is heavy, God. And, and to give up seems easier. To not fight anymore seems easier. I pray for the one that feels like that, God, for many that might feel that way. I pray, Father, that you would breathe in their direction right now, that they would not be able to doubt the very love and commitment and promise that you bring is very much alive, very much alive in the details of their lives and of their circumstances, Jesus, that they would find it within themselves to be a little more brave today, to be a little more courageous, to fight a little harder, to believe a little grander, to trust a little more, and trust in you for the things that we can't see, trust in you for the things that are unknown, Father that we would be more on a journey of building our faith and building our knowledge of you, Jesus. Not just knowing who you are, bits and pieces, but really knowing who you are, because I think when we know the character of God better, then we understand sometimes why things are allowed to happen in our lives. I pray a blessing. I pray that you would um, bring increase, Father, that you would bring wholeness, that you'd bring healing, in the lives of those that are asking for it, God, I pray that you would meet those needs, Jesus. You know the timing of it. And I pray that in the waiting, God, that we would not grow weary, that we would trust you in the waiting, that you're working all things out for our good, Jesus. Always for our good. Help us to understand that, to believe that, God. That nothing passes through your hands first without your knowledge or permission that we are capable of living again. We are capable of choosing life. And that this time that we have on earth is so much shorter than we could have ever imagined, especially now as we get closer and closer to seeing you, God. I pray that you'd make us all stronger believers, Father, that we would choose wisely, choose wisely the things that surround our lives and what we listen to and what we believe. It would first be the voice of God, in the name of Jesus, we love you. We're grateful for you. Amen. Amen. Well, Tammy, thanks so much. It's just been a delight.